We are back, everybody. This is a live recording on stage at ICC Day 3 here in Nashville. Just when you think the weekend can't get any bigger. I mean, Day 2 last night took a stunner in front of a live crowd, streamed across social media, helped raise money for the Nashville Humane Society, and I thought that was going to be the peak of the weekend. But here we are, live on stage again, before all the festivities start and Day 3 gets even crazier. And I'm here on stage with some legitimate royalty. She has not only been an American dad, you've heard her voice in Jumanji, you've heard her in several video games, but most famously and nearest and dearest to my heart, she is the on-screen love interest of one Obi-Wan Kenobi. She is the voice that brought this character to life. She is the voice of the Duchess Satine. This is Anna Graves. Anna, thank you for being here. Good morning, Flynn, my shining Jedi Knight. I considered myself something of a Sith, but you're melting my cold heart. Thank you. See, Thank you. Uh, the Duchess sort of <laughs> tends to do that. This is my angle. Very, very true. And a, a fellow Tennessee native as well. I am. So I'm originally from Memphis. Man. Hey, Memphis. These uh, OG Tennessee natives are hard to find these days. So yeah? It's, uh, it's transplants galore now, and it's like a finding a unicorn if you find somebody that's born here. <laughs> I'm happy to be a rare sighting. I've lived in <laughs> LA for 24 years, and I am, I still keep my southern roots, uh, my niceness, and my Absolutely. politeness, right? So people are constantly asking me, Where are you from? Absolutely. <laughs> and I mean, it, it shows too because, you know, like everybody is blown away by that southern hospitality. You hear the stereotypes, you hear everything, and then you come and experience it, and it's like, Okay, that wasn't an exaggeration. Yeah. They're loading me up with soul food. Now I can't walk. You yeah. know, it's right. Right. Uh, you kind of regret it at the end, but it's well worth. Honey, it. is that your third plate? Have a fourth. Have. A, we're not gonna let you leave here empty. Come on. Come on. <laughs> it's like it's like going to grandma's. You know. Grandma. But you have been all over the place this weekend, and you have done some amazing interviews. You've been asked a lot of great questions. So I want to go kind of a different direction with the ones that I'm going to yeah. ask and expound off of some things that I have experienced and that you have said. Um, talking about your endeavors as a voice actor specifically, you mentioned uh, you know, the ratio of auditions you send to what you actually book, sending those MP3s, forgetting about it, submit it and forget it as people have famously heard me say. How did you get into that mindset? What was it like for you accepting that? And then how do you still apply that to this day, especially if it's a huge role? Yeah, yeah. Dude, that's a great question. Thank and you. I, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say that I'm amazing at <laughs> not getting down on myself. Is but that, I, right? But that is part of the job. That is part of the job as an actor, as a performer, um, is that you try. And you have to be at your top caliber with all those auditions. You have to yep. do your best and then let it go because there are so many other factors that don't have to do with you mm -hmm. uh, that ultimately lead to who will get the role. Absolutely. Ranging from they've worked with someone else before, they know that they love them, they mm -hmm. want to work with them again, to you know, uh, to rates, oh, I don't want to pay that, I want to pay this, yeah. to you know, different things. Like I mean, there's so many factors. So I just give everything my all, 120% mm -hmm. above yep. and beyond. And then put it out there and hope, uh, and it it doesn't always turn out right. But I mean, you you still get the auditions, and yeah, as the saying goes, the auditions are the job. The actual, right. you know, in studio or behind the mic, that's the fun part. Yeah, I mean, you know. Oh and yeah. then when you book one, right, mm -hmm. you have that awesome feeling like it is. I that I did that, and I had a good feeling about that. And does it, that happen to you? It's still so surreal to hear my voice on anything. Yeah. Like it, a manufacturing commercial, something for Stanford University. Those are probably the two biggest things I've done. But it's you hear your voice and it's <laughs> wow. OK, that's me. That, that's yeah. pretty cool. You yeah. know, like it, it's a humbling feeling because you don't I, in my mind, that's not supposed to happen to me. But, yeah. you know, but I mean, that's that's a great mentality to have because the factors that go into it are beyond your control and you can only control the controllables and that's the hardest thing to remind yourself of. Yeah, yeah, so you have to stay positive, remember why you love it and keep going. Absolutely, and then a second question I have for you um, because as I mentioned, you were the on-screen love interest of one Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah. The, what everybody would probably say is the most stereotypical epitome of a Jedi. Mm -hmm. By the virtues, uh, despite him turning a cold shoulder or a blind eye to what Anakin and Padme were doing, he stood by those Jedi morals and values. But then you find out he would be what they might consider flawed because he did have a love interest, said he would walk away from that lifestyle and that order if 
your character had done that. What was it like for you to be introduced as a character that brought that that side of him to the series? What was that like for you? Well, after I pinched myself several times and said, <laughs> this is happening, I'm working on Star Wars. Um, look, Obi-Wan is mm-hmm. a multifaceted character with many sides yes. to him, right? So yeah. his life experiences as a person and as a Jedi have made him who he ultimately becomes mm-hmm. and who we met as old Ben yep. um, in A New Hope, right? Mm-hmm. So it's really great to take a character like his and move backward and say, well, what shifted in him? What made this change? Right. How do we make that, you know? So I definitely took that, his character, into account, mm-hmm. but I also focused a lot on my character and what Dave Filoni wanted to bring to Mandalore. Right, And right. how she was and how what she thought and what her attitude toward Obi-Wan was and Absolutely. what her regrets and what her um, hopes and dreams were aside from being a duchess. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm... I want to be royal. You know, <laughs> I'm not a royal, right? I don't get it. I don't get the pains, the, the, the things that you don't get to do when you have that that um, that responsibility. But she had it. Yep. And so I think together we made a really interesting pairing and we were strong characters that, um, you know, had a lot of chemistry too. Absolutely, absolutely. And then something uh, that really jumps out to me because I, I've heard you do it several times on stage, especially using that very regal, very royal Mm-hmm. That dialect. What led you to pursuing and studying various dialects? Because that's something that I've taken, you know, the responsibility of over the last year. Yeah. And I've learned 13 so far. Oh, but great. How did you uh, become familiar with dialects and bringing those to your character? Well, let me ask you this. Are you a singer? I have a musical background, but I would not consider myself someone you would want to hear sing. <laughs> okay. I can carry a tune, but I don't think you want to hear it. I, uh, I I hear you, but <laughs> even if you don't consider yourself a singer, I feel that it's very important for voice actors to sing yes. and to know their instrument in the mm-hmm. singing realm um, because it has to do with pitch control, it has to do with tone, Absolutely. Um, all those sounds, right? Right. So um, I to create a, a specific timbre for a character or um, really hone in on something, mm-hmm. it's a, it's your this is an instrument. Very I much damaged so. mine two weeks ago, so I'm very husky right now. And I have to tell you, as a voice actor, that is terrible because even my auditions right now sound different right, than right. I normally sound. So if I get hired for Gatorade and they're like, well, wait, where's that raspy voice that you did in the audition? I'm, s- I'm like, sorry, I lost my voice and I was let raspy me, when let me I go auditioned. Let outside for a minute, you know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is – it's – this is it's a precious instrument so Absolutely. for me getting back to like accents and and things like that i think i just always had a good ear mm-hmm. i had a good ear for pitch i had a good ear for um being on key so imitation is the you know very, finest very so. form of flattery correct mm-hmm. right so c- for a character like duchess satine it's said in the specs like kate blanchett from elizabeth and I, lo- I loved that movie. It came out um, not too long before the mm-hmm. Clone Wars started casting. So she had this very regal attitude and very um, sort of, you know, Queen's English. Yes. Uh, uh, but I am no man's Elizabeth. It was that very, you know. So I lightened it up a little bit. <laughs> uh, Obi-Wan, my, my shining Jedi Knight. It, uh, it was the very... Um, and it was interesting, too, because you don't want to try to get into the cadence that Obi-Wan does as well right. or, or try to, oh, no, hello there. I can't mimic that. <laughs> as, you know, not going there. Um, so I had to, the juxtaposition of the two characters, you know, right, I, ca- right. I liked to keep her um, uh, matter of fact. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, very always meaning what she says, but, um, but also... It was fun flirting with Obi Wan. I'm not gonna lie. It <laughs> was uh, it was written into the script. It was right there, in I black like and it. white. I like it. And then my last question before I let you throw one my way cool. is, when you know, there's been videos that have s- made the internet about like the Clone Wars cast being in the same room for auditions or for script reads, whatever it may be. You get that energy in the room to play off each other. When COVID hits or you're in a studio by yourself. How do you bring that same energy or how do you stay out of your own head to not overanalyze and self-direct yourself? Sure. So acting, it's just that imagination Mm -hmm. that you have to bring to the job and you have to. um, So I ask questions from the director 
what's my proximity to the character I'm talking to? Are we right next to each other? Right. Is this pillow talk? Or are we across the room from each other? Am I shouting a little more? What, what's the right, proximity? Right. What's my attitude toward them? Do I like them? Do I not like them? Do I have disdain? Am I uncomfortable? So I need all those questions answered, and then I know how to deliver the lines. Absolutely. Um, if you explain the situation to me, and I can Im- imagine me, you know, if I am in Voltron and I'm in a fighter uh, pilot uh, situation, and I'm trying to explain to someone what's happening around me, I... You know, have I ever been a fighter pilot? No, but I can imagine being yeah. in a stressful situation because sure. I've had stressful stressful situations right. in my own life, right? Mm-hmm. So I recall that memory and use that substitution to get me to that place. Um, and it can be sad sometimes too, like when you're pretending to lament a dear friend in a video game Absolutely. and you don't know who that is. Well, I just pretend that I'm lamenting someone who really means it's something to me right. to the point where I get a little teary and <laughs> the of directors course. are like, oh, that was so sad. You leave, like, it, all, yeah, you leave it all behind the mic. <laughs> you leave it. it all behind the mic. I love it. You I know. I, so when you're, okay, did you start wrestling first and then you ultimately w- became more of a performer and then got into voice acting? I had a little bit um all through high school and middle school, I was a band kid, had a uh, concert, symphonic performance, uh, marching band, all that. Yeah. I had done middle school drama and elementary school, but when you get into band, that takes over your entire life. Sure. So I had that. I had always been a wrestling fan. So as soon as I graduated, um, I had started wrestling, still went to college, worked full-time schedule, full-time college schedule, and wrestled anywhere from three to five nights a week. Started a family, uh, tried to walk away then, came back, inadvertently walked away in 2018, and started voice acting then, got into improv, Shakespeare, and then the dialects too, and it's just got pulled back in after the fact because if somebody that's been doing it for X amount of decades asks you to come back because they want to have a retirement match with you, then you, you can't say no. Right, so, yeah. But it, it's insane how much like that helped me get ready for the full-on endeavors of acting or voice acting, and then how much that helped me bring something different to the table from what I brought, you know, the first time. So right. it's it's insanely different how much this stuff all weighs in together. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you are somebody else when you step in the ring versus who you are in your own life, absolutely. right? Absolutely. So it's the same thing behind the microphone right. or behind the camera. Absolutely. And it's like on here, I'm a nice person, but I don't get paid to be a nice person when I right. wrestle. But I still have all the stuff like you see on the booth back there, you know, donations for the Humane Society, products to sell for the kids. Like, yeah. I just, I want everybody to have something there and I want everybody to benefit from it while I'm having fun doing what I'm doing. Yeah, so. absolutely. No, I think we all love watching somebody fight a good fight. Absolutely. Be it a real fight in the ring mm-hmm. or the fight of taking up for oh people yeah. who can't necessarily fight for themselves. Absolutely. So I think, I, I don't think you're too far off. You're all, you're in the whole, the, <laughs> re- the realm of your true self. Right. And, and that's, that's a big thing of bringing the authentic self to every audition, every character or yeah. every performance you do for sure. Yeah, for sure. For absolutely. Sure. I I know. Well, I totally respect it. Thank I love you. what uh, wrestlers do. I've Thank done a you. lot of like stuff off and on through the years for WWE voiceover wise. So. Oh, okay. So uh, I may not be able to talk about some of that stuff right <laughs> that's now. That's we'll okay. Talk off mic. Cool, about cool, that, cool, so. cool. <laughs> But Anna, seriously, as we're coming up on time here, I want to thank you for uh, coming on here and taking the time in your busy schedule this week. A little bit of a care package for you here. I've got one of my shirts, a couple decals from my wife. Check her out on Etsy, Decals by Kins. Will do. And then I've got a couple photos in my card in there for you as well. So thank you so much. Oh, of course. Let me give you a nice uh, wrestler shout out. Thank you very much, Flynn Hendricks. (laughs) Thank you, guys. Check out ICC for the rest of the day here. Go get subscribed to the podcast. We're on all podcasting platforms, on all social media platforms. Go check it out. The Duchess of Tina proves I think you will like it too. So check us out and come see us at ICC before the day wraps up. And I know you hear me. This summer, saddle up in Smashville as the Music City hosts the hottest party of the summer. WWE SummerSlam Nashville. For the first time ever at Nissan Stadium. A little bit country, a little bit rock and roll, a whole lot of kick ass. WWE SummerSlam, Saturday, July 30th. Tickets on sale now.